Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, Curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. Today, we're continuing our series on naval battles in the Pacific, and we're going to cover the second naval battle of Guadalcanal. This is, geez, I don't know, battle number 100 around the waters of Guadalcanal. Uh, and we're not at the end yet, but so far, every week, we've filmed another one of these videos, and I have said it is it was indecisive, uh, lessons would be learned in the future, but for various reasons, the, the various strategies and tactics don't play out, nothing comes of it, and uh, generally nothing happens. Well, that finally ends tonight. So last week we talked about the first naval battle of Guadalcanal, and uh, in that battle, Admiral Halsey has just been sent to the South Pacific to take over, uh, he finds out that the Japanese are sending in a battleship and cruiser force to bombard Henderson Field, backed up by transports to land a, a large Japanese force. And he sends in everything he's got. He sends in his heavy cruisers, he sends in his anti-aircraft cruisers, uh, he sends in his destroyers, and uh, they manage to stop the Japanese. Uh, the Japanese are fairly timid. They weren't really ready for a naval battle. Uh, and even though they obliterate the U.S. cruiser force, they withdraw, having lost a battleship, their oldest and most obsolete, but still having lost a battleship. Uh, and that causes them to delay some of their other operations. So, not at all decisive at this point. The Japanese do decide to send in landing troops. However, they send back in uh, a pickup force of cruisers and destroyers to bombard Henderson Field. Uh, this is a fairly cautious strike to make sure that uh, the U.S. fleet isn't uh, still there. So I believe only two cruisers actually end up bombarding Henderson Field. And while it does some damage, it's not significant. The U.S. Navy has no ships to send in, uh, so they're unopposed. But the bulk of the force is uh, screening these two cruisers doing the bombardment around on Iron Bottom Sound uh, in case American ships show up. So they pull out. They send in a force of transports. Now, up until now, because of the Cactus Air Force operating out of Henderson Field, the Japanese haven't been able to send in transports with heavy equipment and supplies. They've been sending in destroyers. Uh, and while the destroyers can get in fast, these Tokyo Express destroyers cannot carry the heavy supplies. So they're trying to send in uh, these landing ships to get the heavy stuff in. Well, the carrier Enterprise and the aircraft from Henderson Field that are undamaged are able to take off and do a tremendous amount of damage to this convoy on the way in. Uh, so all of the remaining ships that managed to make it to Guadalcanal choose to beach. They all float as much as they can, but continued air attacks and even some uh, U.S. warships patrolling the area in daylight are able to come in and utterly destroy these ships. Uh, and many of these ships are still there on the beach in Guadalcanal. So the Japanese still have not gotten the supplies they need. Um, by about this point, they're losing around 50 soldiers a day to malnutrition. The United States is able to consistently bring in troops uh, within a short time, uh, November, December of 1942. They're actually able to bring in two entire fresh divisions and rotate out the divisions that initially went in there. Um, so that is what makes Guadalcanal a success for the Allies. Two forces, fairly equally matched at this point in the war, operating at the extreme ends of their uh, resupply route, one by night without air cover, one during the day with air cover, and it's the Americans during the day with air cover that are able to win. But not until the naval battle can be won. We've had two aerial engagements between carriers that have been largely indecisive, uh, and at the end of which, basically all the carriers are removed from the board. The American carriers have all been damaged or sunk. 
the Japanese carriers just don't have skilled pilots left. Uh, so you throw in more surface ships at night. The U.S. is all but out of ships. They've got nothing left but Enterprise's escort. And many of the ships from that escort have already been thrown in at first naval battle of Guadalcanal. The Japanese uh, now have a pickup force left. They've got uh, a number of ships from different areas uh, that include heavy cruisers armed with the dreaded long lance torpedoes, includes the battleship Karishima, which has now been in a couple of engagements and is pretty battle hardened. Uh, and it includes a destroyer force to screen. Halsey, on the other hand, has thrown away two of his fighting admirals in Scott and Callahan. All of his heavy cruisers are out. His two anti-aircraft cruisers are out. Uh, so what does he have left? He has Admiral Willis Lee, who is an expert on gunnery. He was an Olympian with the Colt 45 pistol, and he's an expert on radar-guided 16-inch 45 caliber battleship guns. Uh, so he runs the entire gamut of gunnery as an expert. His flagship is the battleship Washington. Uh, and he also has the battleship South Dakota, which has been damaged during some of the carrier battles and uh, still has some damage to one of her gun turrets. So she doesn't have all nine of her guns working effectively. Uh, but this is what Halsey has. So he takes Lee and these two battleships, which haven't really operated together before, um, and he takes four destroyers. Does he take an entire four destroyer division? No. He picks the four destroyers to have the most fuel. They have to go in right now, tonight. None of these destroyers have operated together before. They're from four different divisions. But they've got relatively full tanks of oil, so they form a line of head column uh, to screen for the battleships, and then the two battleships go in. This is incredibly risky. Uh, the U.S. have lost a number of their large ships, primarily cruisers, to Japanese torpedoes in night fights. Uh, they have yet to develop an answer for this, and thanks to damage sustained from North Carolina uh, via a Japanese torpedo, we now know that the American torpedo defense is inefficient to stop the Japanese torpedoes. And yet Halsey is aggressive. This is all he's got left, so he's throwing them in there. He has been told to support the Marines ashore, uh, and he's not going to leave them abandoned like he had to the night before. So the Japanese ships come in, uh, and in typical Japanese fashion, um, they come in in a number of groups. It's always a complex battle plan for these guys. And that means that even though they've got more ships and uh, potentially more fighting power, thanks to the long lance torpedo, many of these ships don't get into the engagement at all or aren't involved in a meaningful way. This time, Admiral Kondo the second in charge of the combined fleet after Yamamoto is in charge. He's got uh, Kurishima battleship. She is loaded with these special, uh, basically shotgun shells for a 14 inch gun. that are designed to destroy the runways on Guadalcanal. Uh, so again, she's not ready for a surface fight, which is why various cruiser and destroyer forces are going around Savo Island and into the slot to check for American ships. Uh, Lee does something a little non-traditional. Rather than screening his entire force to protect them, he puts all of his destroyers in front of his line and sends them in uh, to make contact with the Japanese, and he's got his battleships in the rear. He is an individual who finally trusts his radar. His two battleships have been trained to use their radar fire control and to track the enemies with radar. Um, and Lee is finally an admiral who has the most modern radar available on his flagship and uses it. They are tracking Japanese ships, um, but they're all over the place and it's nighttime again, so it's always confusing. 
Um, so Lee isn't entirely sure where South Dakota, his other battleship, is throughout the battle, and this causes him to hold his fire, especially early on. Uh, the four American destroyers go in and make contact with the Japanese. The Japanese have really superior night optics and they see the Americans. Uh, a quick gun battle ensues and immediately all four American destroyers are knocked out. Two are sunk outright, uh, one sinks the next day, and the other one is disabled and has to withdraw. Uh, immediately, space of a few minutes here. And so Lee is left with just his two battleships surrounded by Japanese torpedoes and an enemy battleship. The American destroyers did what they were supposed to do though. They revealed the position of the Japanese. Lee can now see from the flashes where they are compared to his own ships. Uh, and thanks to some of the burning ships now in the area, he is uh, he has some light to see by. Uh, and the Japanese never launch an effective torpedo attack because of the screening of the American destroyers here. So they, they did, did their job. Lee sees a, a Japanese destroyer alone nearby, opens up with Washington's secondary battery, and destroys her outright. The Japanese aren't entirely sure what the Americans have. They assume it's two heavy cruisers. That's all the Americans have brought in the past. Uh, and the silhouettes of American warships all tend to be fairly similar, with two turrets forward, one aft, uh, a kind of tall tower superstructure. Sometimes it's a tripod, sometimes it's a lower citadel type. But at night, the, the Japanese aren't entirely sure what's there. South Dakota is suffering some severe issues. She fired her guns at a target that would bear that wasn't optimal. Uh, the, the two American battleships are at this point within five miles of the enemy fleet. So that's knife fighting range. Armor no longer counts for anything. Uh, theoretically, the American battleships have a little over 12 inch armor. The Japanese battleship has nine inch armor. Uh, but again, at point blank range, Armor doesn't count for anything. So, South Dakota starts firing. Uh, normally a battleship needs to fire broadside. In a battle like this, you, you don't try to get the perfect angle. You fire at whatever target will bear. So her guns were firing a little bit over the bow and her aft turret was trained towards the superstructure. Well, this caused blast damage. Uh, and this blast damage managed to trip some circuit breakers, uh, which threw a lot of the fire control equipment out. Uh, battleships have massive redundancy, but without the fire control equipment, um, it's, they're severely hampered at night. And when she fired, the Japanese saw her and they started shooting at her. This caused her to catch on fire, which caused them to fire at her more. Now, fortunately, because of the layered nature of South Dakota's armor, which is virtually identical to New Jersey, check out this video on armor on Iowa class battleships, uh, the hits tended to detonate on the outer inch and a half shell plating and did not detonate on the 12.2 inch belt armor, uh, so they didn't punch through. And thankfully, a lot of the Japanese shells were not armor piercing. They were designed for shore bombardment. However, her superstructure, including all of the electronics for the radars, the fire control, and the communications for fire control were knocked out almost instantly. There are some backups for these, uh, and within a couple of minutes, they could be brought online. But even though South Dakota was never threatened in any serious way. Uh, she never took on significant water. Her stability was never threatened. Uh, nothing ever spread. Uh, she was rendered useless as a battleship. With one exception. Washington was able to sail behind her and be completely screened. Now, Lee had been holding his fire because he didn't know where uh, 
Kirishima was versus South Dakota. He didn't know which of the two pips on his radar screen was which. With South Dakota now burning and very evidently revealed, he now knew where Kirishima was and had her at about 9,000 yards. So he ordered his main guns to open fire uh, and scored somewhere between 9 and 20 16-inch hits at point-blank range. Um, Kirishima was knocked out instantly. Several of the hits struck below the waterline uh, and began to flood the ship. Several of the hits knocked out her main battery so that none of her 14-inch guns were able to fire. Uh, her command and control facilities were taken out instantly. Uh, and it wasn't just the main battery hitting. The secondary battery got dozens of hits as well. And while the five-inch guns couldn't knock through uh, the Japanese armored belt, they did completely ravage her superstructure and uh, destroy much of her command and control ability, same as South Dakota's had been knocked out. Having lost his battleship, Kondo retreated. He did not bombard Henderson Field. That would remain operational. Uh, and this is the decisive battle that wins Guadalcanal for the Allies. There's still months of fighting ahead, but during the first naval battle of Guadalcanal two days ago, the Japanese held every advantage. The United States had learned no lessons and was only getting weaker as its ships were taken out. From this point on, it's the Japanese who are getting weaker uh, for the entire rest of the war, while the United States Navy starts to implement changes based on the things that they've learned around Guadalcanal. Uh, they start to bring new warships online. By mid-1943, they've replaced everything that they've lost from Pearl Harbor through First Guadalcanal. Uh, and they begin to bring these new tactics and equipment online, and that, that's the end. There won't be another major battle that uh, is really strategically important until the Philippine Sea, uh, which is called the, uh, the Marianas Turkey Shoot. It's a slaughter, basically. Uh, and then that's it for the Japanese. So Halsey took a tremendous risk, as did Yamamoto. He'd already, Halsey had lost many of his ships. Yamamoto had lost one of his battleships. They each send in their last remaining stuff. Uh, and Willis Lee showed his great quality. He will emerge from World War II as the great battleship admiral. And uh, that's, the, that's the battle in a nutshell. So what to look forward to in the future. There are some more naval battles around Guadalcanal. Uh, nothing too strategically important, but there's still ships trying to bring in supplies operating in these waters. Uh, so we'll cover those in future videos. Otherwise, if you have any questions, drop them for us in the comment section down below. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. If you have any uh, interest in supporting the museum or our YouTube ch channel, Check the description down below for ways you can help us. Remember to like, share, and subscribe so you're notified when we're putting out new content.